Hello, I'm Maria and I'm here to talk to you today about violet. Common blue violet to be exact. But before I start the video, I just want to say thanks for watching. If you enjoy it, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. Thanks a lot! So what is violet? Violet covers a lot of different species. It's different species within the genus Viola. There's over a hundred species of that in North America. But today I'm talking specifically about common blue violet, which is really common in Eastern North America, um, in the US and Canada, and can be found in yards, parks, boulevards, bro sides, trail sides, places like that. So this is, if you live in Eastern North America, this is the violet that you're most likely to encounter. And common blue violet is a native perennial. So a perennial plant is one that comes back year after year. So if you find it growing in one place one year, it should come back there the next year, provided that it's not cut down or dug up or something like that. So like I just said, it's really common in yards and parks and places like that. And surrounded here, all, well not all, but many of these leaves around me are common blue violet. And we have a bunch of the blossoms in here too, which might be hard to see because the leaves are so tall that they're covering them up, but they're in there. And yeah, it's often like a pretty weedy plant, like it'll just be covering the surface of a lawn. And it might be, you know, for people who want a perfect green manicured lawn, it might be considered a nuisance to some, but I think it's really pretty. And of course it's edible and medicinal. So you get that upside too. So how do you identify common blue violet? Probably most of you are familiar with violet and have a pretty good idea of what it looks like, but there are a few species that you could confuse it with. So I do wanna go over identification just to make sure that you're getting it right. If you take a look at the leaves here, you can see they're heart-shaped. It's a little hard to see because they're rolling like that, but they have a heart-shaped base and the edges are toothed and the toothing is pretty round. And the leaves grow on long stems and those stems are often hairy, but not always. Here's a cluster of violet flowers and you can see that each leaf is coming out of the ground. Violet only has basal leaves, which means the leaves are coming out of the ground. If you look at the actual stems of the flower, there's no leaves along there. Now here's a close-up of the flower. You might think you know what a violet flower looks like, but have you ever looked at it this closely? So common blue violets are usually blue or violet in color, but they actually can be mostly white. And they have five petals, and you can see that the petals are not radially symmetrical. So you can divide the flower lengthwise down the half, and it'll be symmetrical, but you can't divide it any which way to be symmetrical, like a sunflower. So that's one identifying feature. The petal at the bottom is smaller than all the other petals. And you can see it has that white coloring with the dark blue or purple veins. And if you look really closely, you can see that the two opposing petals have a little beard is what they call it there's little fuzz on the two opposing petals. It grows on a single stem. So each stem has only one flower at the end of it. And there's no leaves that grow on the stem. There's like these little nub-like leaves, but no actual full leaves. And then the last thing is that if you take a side view, there's a spur in the back. So that's actually from the bottom petal poking through the back. 
and it creates a spur or like a little lump there that pokes through the sepals. The sepals are those green leaf-like things that surround the flower. So you also want to look for that spur there. That's all things to look for when identifying common blue violet. So I just wanted to show you a close-up of this plant. This is all ground ivy or gill over the ground. It's got a lot of different names, but it's a very common plant in the mint family that's often found in yards and along roadsides and trail sides. And I just want to point out because it's another plant with purple flowers and rounded serrations on the leaves that at first glance might look similar to violet. But it's not violet. It is a completely different plant. This is in the mint family. And there's a few other plants that are related to this that look similar, like dead nettle and henbit. Both look pretty similar. And they are all edible, so if you happen to confuse them, it's not like a deadly mistake or something. It'll just taste different than you expect. So I just wanted to point out a few ways to tell the difference between these plants and violet. So first of all, the leaves are much smaller, the flowers are much smaller, and the flowers are a different shape. And it's this tube shape on the flower. And if you look at the stem or roll the stem between your fingers, you'll see it's a square stem. And like I said about violet, it doesn't have any leaves on the flower stem, but this is all leaves on the flower stem. So ground ivy, henbit, dead nettle, all those plants, they don't have basil leaves, it's only leaves on the stem. And the leaves are directly opposite each other. So there's one leaf that grows here on the stem and one leaf that grows directly opposite it on the other side of the stem. And if you crush this plant, it smells I mean, it's in the mint family. It smells vaguely minty. It's pretty pungent, kind of skunky smelling, but it has a very different aroma from violet, which the leaves of violet don't really have much of a smell. So yeah, that's how you can tell them all apart. So the time of year you want to harvest violet is in the spring. So right now it's the end of May and we still have the blossoms here in Minneapolis. They come up around the beginning of May or late April, depending on the season, and they'll be around for a couple weeks or so still. So this is actually the perfect stage at which to eat violet leaves. You can see that it's light green in color, it's slightly translucent, and the rolling is a sign that it's unfurling. So that's a sign that the leaves are young. Whereas you can see some of these that have been chopped by the lawnmower are darker in color and they don't have that rolling action at the base. The leaves are best early in the spring and they come out before the flower does. And if you know of a violet patch and you've been watching it for years and you're really familiar with it, you can definitely harvest those leaves before the flower comes up. But you want to be really sure that it belongs to a violet plant, right? You don't want to be eating the wrong thing. So how do you eat a violet? Well, it's the flowers and leaf that you want to eat. You don't want to eat the roots. Those are reportedly toxic. And the leaf stem and the flower stem, some people have reported adverse reactions from eating those. So just know that, and if you do decide to eat them, just be careful. But definitely the leaves and the flowers are safe. So what do you do with these parts? Well, first of all, they're edible. They're also medicinal, which I'll get into later. 
What you do with the leaves, you can eat them raw. So just put them in a salad or a sandwich or boil them into a pesto or put them in a smoothie. They're really good like that. Or you can cook them, like steam them or saute them and eat it like a cooked green. And both ways, it's really tasty. It's got a pretty mild flavor. It doesn't have that bitterness that dandelion or some of the other wild greens do. So it's actually really good. And the flowers are also edible raw. And you might have seen them. They often decorate cakes and cookies and muffins and that kind of thing. And they're super pretty, adorning different confections like that. And they're also really pretty in salads. So you just take like a small handful of the violet flowers and throw them raw into a salad. And it's really colorful and pretty and bright and tasty. And people will be like so impressed by you. Um, another option is candying them or making a jelly or making a syrup. And you can search online for specific recipes for that, but all those are pretty simple to do. And you can also do something that's maybe a little shishi, but I think it's cool. You can take a violet flower and freeze them into ice cube trays. So you just like fill the ice cube trays with a little bit of water, like a third of the way full. And then you put one single violet flower in each of the trays and then you fill it with water and then you freeze it. And then when people are over at your place, you're throwing a cocktail soiree or whatever, you can pop out those ice cubes and give them to people in their drinks and it'll just be really pretty and fancy and people will be very, very impressed again. That's why I forage, just to impress people. It's no other reason. Um, yeah, give it a try. They're tasty. Most people enjoy the flavor of both the flowers and the leaves and I recommend trying them out. So medicinally for violets, you also use the flowers and the leaves. And for that, usually people make a tea or if they're using it externally, they'll make like a salve or a cream or uh, infused oil or something like that. So the flowers and leaves are really well known and they have a long history of being used as a respiratory treatment. So treating things like coughs and bronchitis and that kind of stuff and it also topically is used for skin irritations, eczema, bug bites, abrasions, that kind of thing. And it's got a host of other uses including being a lymphatic cleanser but the main two uses are as a skin ointment and as a respiratory treatment. It is safer to eat the violet leaves after the actual flowers have appeared because that way you know for sure that it is a violet. You can use the violet flower to identify the plant. You also don't want to eat African violets. So African violets aren't actually in the genus Viola at all. So they're not that closely related to the common blue violet. And they're not edible and just don't try to eat them. <laughs> don't assume that something with violet in the name is edible because there are lots of plants that have violet in the common name when they're actually not in the viola genus. And again, like this sh should be obvious, but don't assume that you can eat a plant just because it's purple. There's lots of plants with purple flowers. There's plants that look pretty similar to violet that if you didn't take a closer look, you might assume were violet. So that's why I'm going over these identification marks with you so you can make sure you're eating the correct thing. I also want to say that there's some controversy about which colors of violet are edible. Some wild food authors recommend staying away from yellow violets and saying that those can cause bad reactions in people or that they're toxic. I can't speak from personal experience because I've only ever eaten the common blue violet and that's why this video is all about that specific plant. So if you live in an area with a lot of yellow violets, I would definitely do some research, maybe ask some local foragers and see if those are good to eat. And then finally, keep sustainability in mind. Like I said, there's so many different species of violets and you don't wanna accidentally pick one that's rare or endangered. 
in the city, that's probably not a huge concern. You know, if I'm picking violets from someone's lawn, it's probably not a threatened violet. But in the state of Minnesota, there are actually two different violets on the state threatened list. So in your state, you might have a similar list and you just want to be sure you're not picking those and further endangering the plant. All right, that was my video about violets. Thanks for watching. I hope that you learned a few things and that you're inspired to go try some violets yourself. If you liked the video, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. It's a great way to help me out for free. If you do happen to have a few extra dollars a month, you can swing over to my Patreon and pledge some support there. It starts at just a dollar a month and it helps me to keep producing this free informative content for you all. So either way, I hope you have a good one and happy foraging.